All right, guys, today we are going to be talking about misconceptions of a survival knife. And what we're going to be focusing on in this video is really talking about and going over what I would consider common misconceptions or almost kind of uh, tropes to what a bush, what a survival knife needs to be. And essentially talking about the realities of a survival knife and just from what I found out through my own personal experience, you know, what works well and what are often bought lies to survival. So once again, this is also going to be like many things, very um, contentious. Obviously other people will have their own opinions to what I'm about to say. Some people agree, some people won't agree. And yeah, this is just, of course, as per always, my findings through my own testing and practices of bushcraft and survival in Alaska. So I'm not necessarily the end all to beat all, I'm not necessarily going out here claiming to be an expert, just saying that I've, you know, been in the game for a little while, I've done a lot of things. And honestly, I've, you know, experienced and practiced practiced with a lot of different survival knives. And I figured that this knife that I'm holding in my hand, this is a Benchmade 556 Mini Griptilian, would be a really good knife to kind of um, start or spark the conversation because I think that this knife right here flies in the face of pretty much almost any trope or kind of classical idea of what you would expect in a good survival knife. You know, this is a very small, you know, sub seven inch overall length blade. It's of course a pre-broken knife as they say because it is a folding knife and realistically I have done everything from batoned wood to feather sticking to skinning um, small game animals with a Benchmade 556 Griptilian. And so I would say that a lot of the classical survival knife tasks that you would do or expect a survival knife to do, I have actually done for sure in like, you know, actual practice and on camera with a Benchmade 556 Mini Griptilian. So with that said, do I think that this is the best survival knife? Um, <clears throat> no, I don't. I definitely don't think that is the case, but it also isn't the worst because it does actually function and perform the survival tasks. So, you know, if this is what all you can fit into your, you know, Altoid survival tin kit, I do think that this is a valiant option, but I don't necessarily think that it's the best option. However, I do like that, you know, it flies in the face of a lot of what we're told. All right, so let's, now that we've kind of talked about that and explained how you don't actually need necessarily a big, huge, burly knife, let's talk about some of what most people would think a survival knife should look like. Now, I would say for the majority of people, like the overwhelming majority of people, this Survive Knives GSO 5.1 is probably what most people would consider to be a survival knife. And what I mean by this is you're dealing with a reasonably thick, piece of full tang, exposed full tang steel here. And you're dealing with a pretty good steel, this is Magna Cut, and an overall length of a little bit over 11 inches. Now, some people might prefer a even longer blade length here than this one, but for the most part, I would say that this really ticks most of the boxes for what people would consider to be a good or adequate survival knife. You have, you know, a tang that can strike ferrocerium rods. You have a good degree Degree of once again thick full tang steel that can baton wood. You have a really good saber or flat grind for feather sticking. Magna cut steel is going to give you good performance. And this is, like I said, I think what most people would consider to be peak survival knife right here. But there is a lot of other really solid knives out there. And this isn't necessarily a go-to for me. This is the Scrapyard Knives or Knife Co. Um, WS 1021. And this isn't necessarily what I would say like my go-to survival knife would be. Personally, more for the blade length more than anything at all. But this kind of flies in the face of what we would think a survival knife should be. And for a few reasons. First off, this is not a full tang or at least a true 
full tang you know there's no tang protruding out the end of it this is a near full tang knife which in my opinion is perfectly adequate for hard use and abuse I, these really can take a great deal of um, torture and i think that's one thing that a lot of people misconceive is that if you have a true half tang knife there is an actual presence or risk of the handle delaminating breaking fracturing or you know in some way failing the knife as a whole especially if you are batoning but if the tang of the knife runs three quarters if not more i think the tang on this guy runs to about here you know realistically speaking that shock is going to be so well dispersed that just because you don't have a tang sticking out at the end does not mean that this knife is somehow less durable it actually has very little to do with its end durability so you know for, for me like I said, this is a huge misconception that a lot of people think that you know three quarter tang knives are somehow less durable especially like when we're talking about you know um, smaller blade lengths but once again if this if this baby you know um, bench made 5d6 griptilian can survive being batoned is there a lot of force through batoning yes but there's not as much force as you would think in addition to batoning is always a, a really interesting game because batoning does have a lot of force but if you're hitting things such as wood that have give to them and are designed to split apart there's a lot of force being not only exerted on the knife but it's transferred through to the material you're trying to baton so when it comes to batoning it's not necessarily as um, hard or vicious or cruel as you might actually think because so long as the knife is just absolutely not designed to fail a lot of that energy tr is going to transfer from the knife to the material now where you begin to have issues with batoning is when you're trying to baton something like a piece of metal like say you're trying to cut a piece of chain where you know when you smack the knife the full energy of that impact is not only going into the blade but it's unable to move or pass or you know get that energy out of it so when you do that you're far more likely to break a blade um, but once again Having a you know non full tang blade is not a deal breaker by any means. Once again, three quarter tang is perfectly fine. Now another one that I think is a common trope and a misconception in survival knives as a whole is that you need a super thick blade. Now once again, this WS uh, 1021 is about a tenth of an inch thick. And to give you guys some comparison here, here is that GSO, the aforementioned GSO. And hopefully you guys can see here, kind of trying to compare them trying to compare the two you guys can see there that that is the relative thickness this is about 5 30 seconds of an inch thick so this is about 0 0.17 i want to say maybe this is a little bit let me see maybe this is a little bit thicker nah it's, a, it's about 5 30 seconds so 5 30 seconds is actually thin even to some you know a another one that a lot of people like is about quarter inch thick so this is a quarter inch thick versus tenth of an inch thick you see that there's a pretty substantial difference in blade stock there and while i will say and i will give the point to the fact that if you are using your knife to split apart wood of course the larger and more wedge shaped your knife is the easier it will split apart wood however this is there's always a balance here because if you're just looking for a wedge you would be better suited with something like a hatchet or an axe because that's an actual true wedge you know knives are always going to be thinner than an axe so you know you have to kind of take it for what it's worth but honestly in my findings, like a tenth of an inch thick blade might, you know, take four or five wax more um, through a hard piece of wood to get it split, you know, to get it batoned through. But realistically speaking, is there going to be a significant energy increase to make a tenth of an inch work over a quarter inch? Not necessarily. And once again, that also kind of goes back to the thickness or density of wood that you're batoning as well. But I have found, in my opinion, that, you know, thinner knives, once again, so long as they're made and constructed of good steel and they're not just super brittle, um, should perform just fine. And once again, uh, something like this, um, <clears throat> Scrapyard Knife Company, um, WS1021 is made out of SR101, which is a proprietary version of uh, 52100 ball bearing steel. So it is a decent, it's a decent amount, so it's a decent um, degree of you know strength and durability, but also having a good amount of flexibility. So you're not going to just snap one of these in half. 
So other tropes are that you always need a fixed blade. And fixed blades are, once again, like by and large, I do prefer fixed blades for survival. But once again, going back to the folding knife, such as this, you know, Benchmade 556, this is an access lock and it does perfectly fine at just about any, um, outdoors use application. Now, to be fair, not every Benchmade access lock is the same. So don't necessarily say that, or I can't necessarily say that access locks as a whole are all just super durable, but the access lock is a pretty strong lock. Of course, the triad lock, something like the um, Formax Scout uh, from Cold Steel is another really good example of the triad lock being a folding or broken knife that is a functional fixed blade like when it is in its locked form good luck honestly trying to break a triad lock because you can do it and you can break just about any knife if you try hard enough in some capacity break the knife um, but something like the triad lock gives you a functional ability to make that knife very rigid very hard it's not going to fail under pressure it's not going to fail under load um, it is going to be very strong uh, blade. So do you always need a fixed blade? Absolutely not. Now I will say to the credit of fixed blades, one of the big things that you will typically find with a good survival fixed blade and most fixed blades as a whole that does give it the leg up over pretty much every folder is that every folder known to existence except for the rare few weird exceptions are going to have the same issue and that is that the blade has to be physically shorter than the handle because of, the, of course the blade goes into the handle and so obviously if the blade was longer than the handle they would protrude and just cut you right so with every folding knife this is the exception that by and large outside of the weird you know handful of knives that break this rule there <clears throat> your blade length is going to be shorter than your handle length so with something like a four max scout you have the issue of having a very unwieldy handle to have a four inch blade or on other knives like the 556 you have to sacrifice having a shorter blade to have a usable handle that is compact this is something that once again as i just showed with the gso 5.1 obviously fixed blades can get away with having a longer blade than a handle or having a shorter handle and a longer blade and this proportion um, kind of speaking means that you can get more bang for your buck and have a longer blade on still a decently sized handle so once again this isn't always a hard and fast rule there are some fixed blades that are more even um, or once again with the case of this ws1020 the handle is longer than the blade so once again could work out as a folding knife too but um, by and large like I said, this isn't a hard and fast rule but by and large you are going to see the ability to have a longer more usable blade in a fixed blade as opposed to a folder so there is that credit and merit to fixed blades but once again if you have a four inch blade length that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't do anything with survival once again i've done a lot of survival goods with this or a lot of survival practice with this little 556 so like you can't really say like these smaller knives don't sleep on them so like honestly they are better than you'd think so anyways, guys, these are some of the common misconceptions and kind of tropes that get touted um, in survival practice and training. And I'm not necessarily saying that, you know, your first survival knife should be a Benchmade 556 mini grip. But really what I am trying to say is that there are a lot of other really good knives out there. Things like the WS1021, things like the, you know, Mora 511 that are they the best survival knives? Not necessarily, but don't discount them and don't think that they can't do good survival work because honestly some of these knives really are quite functional and you don't necessarily have to have a thick huge overbuilt knife i mean honestly people like morris kohansky were running around in the 80s with things like mora clippers and honestly they could probably run circles around you with a mora clipper while you're sitting there with like a big you know survive gso 5.1 right so once again not saying that the survive gso 5.1 is a bad knife because it is a good knife in its own right but at the same time too it is worth noting by and large that um, <clears throat> there are other really solid blades out there and 
do give some credit to some of the smaller, thinner uh, blades because they actually can put in a lot of good work. Anyways, guys, hopefully you enjoyed the video. As always, God bless, and I'm out.